Okay, so good afternoon everybody. Welcome to APNIC e-learning web class. Today is the 8th of January in 2014. This is the fourth session that we are covering for today. Again, we're all covering IPv6 related topics. And this last one is about IPv6 address planning. So in here, we will be looking at, we will be using a lot of the things that we've um, we've learned from today, um, from the very basic overview to IPv6 addressing to transition, we will be using all of those conceptual knowledge that we've understood and then apply them into something more practical. So I think coming into this class, you, um, you, you have all those tools already, but it's more like you have been given the opportunity or maybe the responsibility to create the proper address plan for your organization. So here, we will be looking at a sample, um, two samples um, in which you can probably implement whether you're an ISP that has uh, maybe, um, like it's a two set up. One is if you have an ISP that also has web hosting or maybe other types of hosting um, sites. And also if you're just an ISP with a growing number of customers. So um, hopefully this will be useful for everybody. There are plenty of ways to implement something like this. Um, this is one of them, and I've seen a lot of people in the industry doing something very similar as well. Now, before we go into that, I'd like to first introduce myself, of course. My name is Cheryl Hermoso. I work as a training officer for APNIC, and as part of the APNIC training team, I deliver or we deliver courses on internet-related topics such as IPv6, DNS, DNS security, routing, uh, internet resource management, and network security. Now, e-learning courses are provided for free for those of us who are having a hard time joining the proper face-to-face -face workshops. Now, this class will run for one hour, and then at the end of the um, session, I'll be asking you to fill in a survey for us. So, what are we going to do for this afternoon? Um, so, very simple, um, but again, it's very elaborate. Um, because it's an example, we will just go through them really quickly, but hopefully you will see the pattern and it will be useful once you do your own um, addressing plan. So we'll look at um, how to get IPv6 addresses, just, just a review on where do you get them from, how much can you get, um, what are the ways to get them, is it through ISP, it also can be through your RIR, things like that, and how much can you get from them, which is slash 32 for um, for an ISP and slash 48 if you are an enterprise. We will be looking at two things when, when it comes to addressing planning. Um, it can be um, from the side of an ISP infrastructure, in which case you are the one actually distributing IPv6 address blocks to your customers and also from the customer side. It can be also from the ISP side, but on their infrastructure, wherein you are going to use these IP addresses to actually assign to different parts of your network infrastructure. So as part of that, we have an example address plan. Again, I told you we'll be looking at two options um, and two possible strategies as well. And towards the end, just some addressing tools that you can use because uh, of course, once your network gets bigger and bigger, you don't want to be hassled with um, renumbering and like going through all these um, IPv6 addresses again and again. So you need to have a scheme. You need to have a way in which you can automate um, the addressing for you. All right, so first off, where do you get IPv6 addresses? Of course, there are there's um, all the RIRs. The RIR or the Regional Internet Registry is the main point where you can get your IPv6 address block. There's a couple of ways that you can do that. One is um, um, through the RIR, of course, and the other is using your upstream providers. Um, with the RIR, it can also be with your corresponding NIR. So what's an NIR? It's a national internet registry. It's something that's quite unique in the Asia Pacific region. Some countries or some economies have their own NIR. So you can request from them and then the NIR will come to APNIC to um, get the allocation in your behalf. So places like um, Indonesia, China, um, I think um, Japan, um, and a few others, 
they have their own um, national internet registry. So it's just a one extra step. So from RIR going into the customer. So each RIR have specific eligibility rules. So if let's say you are a company that spans more than one region, maybe you have um, a presence in North America, in which case you go to Erin, and you also have a presence in Asia, in which case you would go come to APNIC for your allocation, then the um, eligibility rules, the um, policies might be a bit different. So you'll have to check with them. You'll have to check the policy documents um, that applies to which region. Okay, so um, because that's because all the RIRs are independent or autonomous of each other. They have coordination, but the way that policies are developed is bottom up. It's based on the needs of the customers or the members, and members actually do the proposals. That's why there are some differences when it comes to these policies. But basically, the idea there is go to your ISP, uh, sorry, go to your RIR if you're an ISP, and check with them what are the policies, check whether you're eligible, okay, and then you'll go from there. So this is the regions, um, just a map of the regions. Of course, APNIC region is around here. So how do you get your IPv6 address space? Um, I think I've mentioned this in previous um, sessions within today. Um, one is, of course, if you're already an APNIC member. If you're an APNIC member, it's very easy. We have two programs. One is the one-click policy. That is, if you already have an IPv4 address block. If you currently have an allocation, okay, maybe it's whatever size it is, but it's an allocation, meaning it's a, uh, it's a, um, a block that you will give away to your customers, then you are entitled to a slash 32 IPv6 block. If you have an assignment, something that you use for your own infrastructure, then you are eligible for a slash 48 IPv6 block. Now, this is not um, the, um, the, it's a normal maximum, but it's not limited to that. If you need more, you can always get more. You can get a subsequent allocation for you um, and your customers as well. Now, if you are not an APNIC member, then you'll have to get through these um, eligibility rules. Um, you have to become a member and you have to, you can apply for the resources at the same time anyway. So you'll save more time on that. So there's a requirement when it comes to the application, you need to have a plan of your, um, say, your network growth, um, how are you going to use up those IPv6 addresses, how many are you going to um, allocate to your customers after a year and after a couple of years. So read through the policy document, it changes every six months or so, um, depending whether um, the members find that uh, it doesn't suit their needs anymore, therefore there will be new proposals. But um, yeah, the, the rule there is just check the policy first before you apply for your allocation. All right. The other way to get your IPv6 address is, of course, using your upstream providers. Most upstream providers, now this is especially good if you are not an APNIC member yet and you don't see a need to get um, a portable IP address, then you just come to your upstream providers. Most upstreams delegate a sub block to their customers and while it varies, again, they have different policies themselves when it comes to how much they will give to their customers, but the normal maximum that you might be able to get is one slash 48 block. So this is good for small and medium sized organizations. If you are something big, um, maybe it's best because you cannot really stretch the slash 48 for a few years, then maybe it's best to just get a slash 32. So the rule of thumb is if your organization is running multiple sites, then you need probably need a slash 32, in which case you would go for the first option, you would go to the RAR and request for your IPv6 address. Okay, so slash 32, I believe, is just the right size, the right amount of space to give you that flexibility when you do your address planning. There is plenty of IPv6 address space. Right, there's plenty of IPv6 address space in uh, available nowadays, and um, I've mentioned this earlier. When you do your address planning, okay, it's it's similar to how you do it in IPv4. However, there might be 
and need to change your mindset a little bit. Okay, we grew up or uh, we're, we're used to the environment where IPv4 is a scarce resource. So when we do our IPv4 address planning, okay, it's mostly to fit in what we currently have, which is a very small amount. With IPv6, you will see that you can get a slash 32. That's a very big space. So you can be a, a bit lenient. Okay, so I guess you can say that it's more like going back into the early internet days. Remember how earlier on when they um, assign IP blocks, they use classful addressing. Okay, while we don't really want to waste IP addresses, um, we have enough to allow for reservation sort of to look into how our network will grow and then save some space that is adjacent to our previous block so that after let's say five years or 10 years, you still have that flexibility. You can still aggregate your blocks and then announce it as one because you have an allocated extra space that can be used for that purpose when your network grows. Okay, so again, while we do not take conservation for granted, we should also limit or we should also not limit our addressing plan just because we want to satisfy conservation. There's plenty of address space. It's okay to be more lenient if that would result in a proper addressing that will allow for our future growth. Okay, so that is the mindset that you have to be on when you start your address planning. Okay, so let's look at some address planning um, BCPs that you will see being done by the internet community. Um, you already know that you get a slash 32, but how do you assign that to your infrastructure? Okay, the idea here is you should know um, your network back, back, backwards and forwards. You should have an idea of how it looks, which areas you need to assign IPv6 blocks, um, basically everything. Don't forget anything. Um, the IPv6 address available to each network operator should be designed to be a scalable plan. Okay, um, where is that? All right, so how much will you get or what parts of your network do you need to assign? Plenty of things. You need to assign to your loopback interfaces, you need to assign perhaps to your point-to-point -point links. You need to assign to your links going to your customers. You need to assign to your transport links in your core uh, core network. All right. So plenty of things. And maybe if you have a data center, you also need to assign a block for that. Okay. So it's a matter of looking at your network topology and. Um, checking which parts needed IPv6 addresses. Um, it doesn't have to be everything. Some parts may be okay with just IPv4, especially if it's just, um, um, let's say, this applies more to end hosts. If it's just the connectivity to your printers and stuff, then you probably don't need that. But in an ISP network, most parts of your topology would probably need IPv6 address. Now, when you do your addressing, one more thing that you need to remember is to use nibble boundaries. Okay, it just makes things a lot simpler. So what is a nibble? A nibble is equivalent to four bits. Each number in an IPv6 address is represented as a nibble. So each hex digit is a nibble. So it's easier to just work on nibbles rather than concerning yourselves looking at say slash 35s or maybe slash um, 57, so that's not very practical to do. So just work on the nibble boundaries of factors of four in your um, prefix. All right, so example, if you have, let's say, 2001db8 colon zero colon 10 slash 60. So this means that your address space or address range would be from 10. 0, 0, 0, 0, up to 10 dot f, 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 f. Easy, right? You don't really need a calculator. You don't really need to write it down. But let's just say that you have another block um, or you want to subdivide your blocks into slash 60 once instead of slash 60. So you'll have, what's the range for a single slash 61? 
So that should probably be 2001 db8 colon 0 colon 10.0.0.0 okay up to um 2001 db um colon 0 colon 17 colon fff so is that very easy to remember probably not you always have to check and recheck your current addressing um, maybe you have a table of all the addresses that you've assigned you'll always have to refer to that and check it but if you have something that is a nibble then probably easier for us to remember so um, um, you you want to you will want to work on nibbles instead of that okay now address blocks for your infrastructure let's just get into more details from here so you have a slash 32 block you got it from your rir your goal now is to plan your network so that you will assign things or blocks into all parts of your infrastructure so what do you need you need a block for your infrastructure you also need a block for your customer assignments you have to keep the infrastructure and the customer assignments separate as much as possible again we'll be using nibble boundaries and this is not exactly wasteful for us so which one do you assign as you can see here you need one for your loopback addresses okay all loopback interfaces will be coming out of a single slash 64 block okay it's just easier to do it that way each loopback address as you know because it, it's referring to a single ip address will be using a slash 128 prefix okay so simple next is what other parts of the infrastructure do you need to assign um, maybe you have um just picture a network topology with four regions okay so maybe your isp has presence in say different parts of the country of your economy and then each of these regions will have like a semi-autonomous part of your network so what do you need to do from your slash 32 assign a single slash 48 per region okay this is applicable for very large providers where each of the region is usually semi-autonomous for majority of the network smaller ones a slash 48 actually for the entire backbone is enough okay but for bigger networks perhaps you use a slash 32 you give a single slash 48 in each of your regions another thing to remember is you must always do summarization okay you must summarize as much as possible again in ipv6 our goal or our let's say when you look at the resource management goals which is you have their conservation aggregation and registration your main priority will be aggregation or summarization you should be able to summarize your blocks per region as much as possible and then announce it as one well. all right so here um what we do is we allow slash 48 per region or slash 48 per backbone let's just skip that one now going to more details into the end side of things not on the core you need to be assigning on um, things on your lab so per LAN, how much do we assign? Slash 64. Okay, simple. It should be a slash 64 per LAN, no matter how small or big each of the LANs would be. Okay, it's always slash 64. Again, that's because of some limitations. So we have an operating systems and all of that. And um, it's just easier to do it that way. The standard RFC 6164, if you want to have a look at that, um, which is this one um, tells us or recommends to use let's say this is for point-to-point -point links uh, the recommendation is to use slash 127 IPv6 prefix for inter router links so if you have point-to-point -point connections based on the practices that you see on the networks um, today um, they use slash 127 why slash 127 oh well that's because you're using two points and in ipv6 you don't really need broadcast um there's no broadcast so you don't need a broadcast address you don't need this um, network address so 
pretty much you only need two IP addresses for both ends. So that thus the slash 127. Now, um, other people would use slash 126. Why slash 126? It's more like if they already have an IPv4 backbone and they are creating the IPv6 addresses all and um, applying it on top of the current IPv4 network. Then they want to mirror as much as possible what they, the rules that they have for IPv4. So since use four addresses in IPv4, which is um, slash 30, now in IPv6, they also use four addresses. So that's equivalent to a slash 126. Okay, so um, there are many others. If you look at the mailing list um, of uh, different network operators groups, you'll see that some of them would be using slash 112 and they have their own reason for doing it. Okay, so these might not be um, the majority, but um, it's it's the way they um, explain it or the way it works for them is um, pretty practical. So I guess you'll just have to look into how these different BCPs would fit into your own implementation. Um, what we would do in the example that we'll be showing you later on is this one. We will be assigning slash 127 per point to point link. However, we will reserve the entire slash 64 block for that link. So you will see that it seems a bit wasteful. You have slash 64 to assign only to two links. But yeah, um, it's a good practice that has that people have been using for quite a while. Again, the reason for that is we have so many IPv6 addresses and um, you'd rather reserve that than create um, a new plan sometime in the future or renumber in the future. Okay, that's just more troublesome to do. Okay, so that is for your infrastructure. Any questions so far? All right, now it, for your customers, again, I think we've already discussed this a bit. Um, you can give anything from slash 64 to slash 48. Make it make slash 48 the largest that you will give to any customer. If you look back into the policy for a, uh, where APNIC would give to their um, for assignments to customers, it's still slash 48. So it's just consistent for you to give slash 48 rather than give something that's bigger than that. However, if you have customers that are perhaps smaller ISPs that uses your service as an upstream, then it, it's okay probably to give something like a slash 40, slash 44 to them. But for all end sites, the largest that you should give is a slash 48. The smallest that you will give is a slash 64, but that is only if you're sure that that network has no way to grow. Most, um, I've seen a lot of um, um, providers that give services to home users. Um, they would tend to go and use slash 64 to assign to the CPEs um, for these end sites. However, if you're working on a free or your customers are small businesses or Soho types, then probably something that's in between slash 56 would be a better way to go. All right. So anything between 64 to 48 and that is totally up to you or up to your company, depending on the policy that you want to implement of that. All right. Now, how about um, What's that? Did I have? Yeah, the pops here. What is a pop? A point of presence. Now, if you have um, pops everywhere, it is. It goes without saying that um, you can actually assign slash forty eight per pop. No matter how big or small that pop is, you can assign a slash forty eight. Okay, so if you have ten pops, it gives. Um, you can possibly have a slash. 52 per pop if you're using a single 48 there and then you can have 4096 point to point links to be used or um, 4000 around 4000 customers um, let's say the connection to your um, customer's CPE so that is for your customer again just assign slash 48 per pop 
let's just okay so this is how it would look like um i think the main advice essentially is to know which ones you're assigning to and once you have that it's time to start looking at the actual ip address and start assigning now this is a, a sample isp infrastructure we have 2001 db8 colon slash 32 for our block and notice that remember i told you that um, you need to separate what goes into your infrastructure block and what goes to your customers so see here we have this infrastructure and the rest will be for your customers you normally assign the first slash 48 for yourself so see here this is your first slash 48 it is used for yourself for your own infrastructure why is that why not the very last one because it's easier the very first block has all the zeros you can uh, abbreviate as much as you want so you can say that it's a selfish reason but it's also something that's easier to scale now from that first slash 48, you get the first slash 64, the very first slash 64, and you use that for your loopback interfaces. All right. And then following the next slash 48, assign that to customer one, next slash 48 to customer two, next slash 48 to customer three. It doesn't have to mean that you are now giving the entire slash 48 to that customer. You're only allotting that slash 48. But it's up to you. Maybe you want to give slash 56 to your customers only. So what you do is that is still reserved for that customers, but you only give the slash 56 out of that slash 48. So that if they come back to you in the future, you will or you can assign something that is adjacent to their current allocation. All right. Okay, so I hope that's clear enough. Now, phase two is if you want to request for a subsequent allocation so for example at some point you've used up there is what we call an hd ratio which is the way that we measure um how many slash 56 blocks have been assigned to your customers and from there if you reach an hd ratio of 0 0.92 that's the time that you can request for a subsequent allocation now here you have say maybe you've, you've already achieved that so you want to request request for another slash 32. So what happens is, again, there is some sort of reservation here. You are now most likely capable of getting the slash 32 that is adjacent to your current allocation, which now gives you a total block of a slash 31. So maybe you have a slash 31 now, you want to request for a subsequent allocation after, let's say, five years then it also doubles what you currently have so you will now get a slash 30. so that is based on the current policies and that might change in the future though okay so let's look at um a, an example soon so we'll just summarize what we have as of at the time being what's the current advice that we can give you the main plan here is you have to prepare your network topology don't forget anything you need to know what which ones to assign which are your infrastructure blocks your point-to-point -point links your loopback addresses if you have points of presence you also have to assign that and then your customer assignments if you have data centers you also need to assign a block for that customer address assignments should not be reserved on a per pop basis and the reason for that is the same principle as we have in ipv4 what happens if one pop grows bigger than the others okay you will end up renumbering because um you are now using up more space in one and then the other one is very scarce and you might need to get some of the addresses that you've assigned to the other ones so if you have one pop that grows bigger than the other again you will result into not renumbering which is not a very good thing so you don't do that also take note of routing considerations i've mentioned about um summarizing aggregating so when you're doing your addressing plan you should know which ip prefixes you're going to carry okay you should know which ones you're announcing to the global internet which ones are um, visible only via ibgp perhaps or ospf and isis which is just local to your 
um, infrastructure. So you should be able to um, identify that those things. Multiple pools should be aggregated as much as possible. Okay, so to give us a better view, so so far we've just listed down the things that are advised to do, but um, most of us wants to see an actual implementation, right? What, um, how do you actually use that knowledge to, um, to do your address plan? So let's look at an example so, so that we all have a better view on how that's done. So we'll have an example address plan. So this one uses a slash 32 block, 24066400 slash 32, which is the block we're using for our training laboratory. So we will be looking at two options. One is for ISP that has a growing customer base. Okay, your customers are growing in your different pops. The next option is for ISP that also has a data center. Okay, and that hosting is also growing bigger. So how does that affect our um, address planning? So let's look at option one first, right? So option one for ISP is growing on internet access. This one. So it's not very clear from this um, slide set, but once you get a copy of the PDF materials, um, I'll, I think the best way is have a look at it again. Um, look at the blocks and which ones or what are they assigned for. Okay, but we'll try as much as possible to get you through it. So you have a slash 32 block. What do we say? You have an ISP that are, is growing with your customer base. So what you do is you have to reserve a lot for your customers. Okay, most likely your infrastructure will remain the same for a while. Okay, the only thing that will happen there is you might need to add um, pops at some point. Right, but when it comes to your data center, um, it's still the same. When it comes to your network backbone, it will most likely still be the same. So what you do is just divide your IP block currently into two. Again, one is for your infrastructure, another is for your customer. So two slash thirty twos. Okay, you will have um, sorry two slash thirty threes. You will have a single slash thirty two. So this is where your subnetting knowledge should come in. Okay, go back to the subnetting um, tutorial if you can't remember. But basically, you should know how to subnet your black block. You have a slash 32, you subdivide them into two. What you have there is 24066400 colon colon slash 33 and 24066400 colon 8000 colon colon slash 33. Okay, so I hope I don't have to explain how we got through that. Now, when you look at these tables, um, for now, um, I would encourage you to skip or don't bother too much about the reverse domain, the SOR, which is the um, second opinion request and registration. So don't bother with that for now and just concentrate on these three columns, block number, the prefix, and what they're used for, the description. So here you see you have block number one, you subdivide them into two, so you have blocks number two and number three, right? So what happens now on block number two? For your infrastructure, what do you do? What do you need it for? So you will assign that into your infrastructure, to your data center, to your customer um, services point-to-point -point links, plus um, some of the customer networks. So these are the links going to the customers. All right, so there you have, what we did was we assigned slash 48s for each. Okay, now question, how many slash 48s can you get from a single slash 33? You should be able to answer that. All right, you should be able to answer that at this point. So again, you give slash 48s. The first slash 48, again, is for your own infrastructure. Okay, I can't emphasize that more. So that's, that's where your loopback addresses, transport, point-to-point -point links would go. And then the next one, next slash 48 will be for your point-to-point -point links. In here, I think we are reserving one, two, three, four. So and the assumption here is you have four regions. Okay, you have four customer sites. 
So that's why you have 4 um, slash 48s there. And then since for each region, most likely you will have the data center. So you also assign slash 48s for each of those data centers. The rest of your blocks will be used for your customers. Now, when you do the actual assignment, most likely than not, you would want to have some space in between your infrastructure and those that you will give to your customer networks. So some people would do is they start the assigning from the very, um, the farthest customer network, which is probably this one, the one at the bottom most, so that your infrastructure will go, um, well, basically will um, increase that way. Your customer network prefix will go that way. So you have some, some leeway somewhere in between them in case you'll need to do some aggregation. So let's look at block number four. Block number four here is for, again, loopback, transport, and point-to-point -point links. So here, what do we do? We mentioned earlier we need to assign slash 64 for our loopback, the very first slash 64. So that's what we did here. You have here this block 24066400 colon colon slash 64 is for our loopback interfaces. Notice that the next one, the adjacent block to it, is not assigned to anything. Okay, this is allowing for future growth. If sometime in the future you need more um, IP addresses, then you have that reserved for you. Okay, and it makes easy, it makes it easier for you to do aggregation as well. So the usually um, you will see that pattern all throughout. You usually um, reserve the block next to what you've already assigned so that you will allow for future growth. Okay, so the next block, the third block, is for your transport links. We've reserved another block somewhere in between that. And the rest is for infrastructure one links. Okay, again, slash 64 per link. Okay, all point to point links, as we've said. Um, the practice that we are using here is we are going to use slash 127 to assign to our point-to-point -point links, but we are assigning the entire slash 64 for that block. So that's what we did here. You have slash 64s for your infrastructure one. Okay, now this is the second half of our slash 32 block. So we have the second slash 33. So this is what you assign to your customers. So slash 48 per customer, right? So um, one, one customer, customer one gets slash 48, customer two, if you have more, you just increment it downwards. Simple as that. So again, if you have this slash 48, perhaps you just want to assign them a smaller amount depending on the size of that uh, company, then maybe just get a smaller block from this slash 56 or slash 64, but still retain the entire slash 48 for that customer for future use. Okay, any questions so far? So that's just a very simplistic view of um, how you can assign IPv6 addresses for an ISP network. Now, the second option here is still very similar to the other one, to option one. However, just a slight change because now we are expecting our data center also to grow. Okay, notice that in option one, our focus or the big chunk of our IPv6 address space goes to the customer. Okay, you essentially just reserve um, one or two slash 48s for us, and then the rest is either for the customer or for the customer one links. Okay, which is part of our infrastructure, but it's still for the um, customers that are connected to each of the POPs. So let's look at option two, which is when we have more, um, more things going on in our infrastructure. So that's the data center. So what we did here, earlier we just subdivided it totally into two. Here, we're working on nibbles. So what is the best one after slash 32, the next biggest one is a slash 36. Okay, so we subdivide our networks into slash 36s. Um, in some cases, people would go for slash 40 rather than slash 36. But in our case, let's just use this. Um, there's nothing much difference anyway. 
So from there, you have your first slash 26 for your infrastructure and for your data center, and the rest will be for your customer networks. Okay, maybe you'll have like one of one slash 26 here will be assigned for the customers for region one, the next slash 26 for the customers for region two, and so on and so forth. So going to um, block number two. So block number two is for your infrastructure plus data center. Again, don't forget what we're using it for. We're using it for two things this time around. Earlier in the previous example, we're only using it for our infrastructure. We are not exactly worried about the data center, right? But here we have a single slash, well, basically you have your slash 36 and you subdivide that into the next nibble, which is a slash 40. Now question for you, how many slash 40s are there in a slash 36? Okay, so answer that and try to write down um, your blocks. It should give you a similar answer to this. Okay, and now um, you only use the first slash 40. Actually, you're only going to use the first slash 48 of this to assign to your loopback transport one links, point to point links. Okay, the rest will be for your data center. Depending on you, you can assign that, say the first four will be assigned to region one, second four slash 40s will be for region two, third um, four slash 40s will be for region three, and then region four. Okay, going into this, your first slash 40, so that will be block number 18. If you look at here, um, you are now giving slash 48s. Okay, subdivide your slash 40 into slash 48s. Okay, so that will come up with a similar setup as option one, only one slash 48 for all the infrastructure links. So you look back, transport infrastructure one goes there. And if you're going to go see that slash 48, notice that it is exactly the same as what we have in option one. We're assigning slash 64s for each of the links. So one slash 64 for your loopback interfaces. As you can see there, the next slash 64 will be assigned for future use. Again, it will be used for your loopback interface. Your next block will be for your transport links. I don't have a proper diagram here. Um, I'm not sure if we have that somewhere in the end, but just try to picture this. You have four networks. You have um, in your core, you have transport links in between your core routers. So your transport link would be used for that. Again, the next one will be assigned or will be reserved for future use. And the, the rest is for point-to-point -point links going to your infrastructure one. So that's your slash 48 block 19, which is this one. And then the rest will be links going into your customer point-to-point -point links. Okay, again, slash 48 is reserved, but you only need to use a single slash 64 out of that slash 48. Okay, now going back to uh, the very first one here, table number one, what did we assign to a customer? One customer network, we're assigning a slash 36. But if you remember, um, um, one of the advice that we gave you is use slash 48 per customer only. Right, so let's look at this. That's block number three, which is somewhere here, right there. So you have, you have the entire slash 36 for your customer network. Now, you can use one slash 36 per region. In this case, maybe this is for region one. You have the entire slash 36, but per customer, you only give a slash 48. Okay, so you have how many slash 48s in a slash 36, that's two raised to eight, which is um, 256. So you can have 256 customers in pop one, in region one, and each of them getting a slash 48 IPv6 block. Okay, so that's, that's how it would work. Now, um, just going back a little bit, um, I told you to just disregard this three uh, columns. So I'll just explain them a little now if you are already quite familiar with the rest of the things. Now, you'll see that it's for reverse domains. Um, 
for each of the blocks, you need to have um, a corresponding uh, reverse zone for that, similar to IPv4, right? In IPv4, you have reverse zones for all your slash 24s or maybe your slash 16, or if even if you have a slash 8, you have to have um, reverse zones for that. Similarly, you do that with IPv6 as well. But notice that when you do it, you're using nibbles. Okay, you're using nibbles. So this is for 2406-6400 block. Okay, so it just makes it easier. And then the add IP6.arpa because that's the um, hierarchy that it has to go through. So you do that with all your blocks. And if, let's say, you've assigned this to your customers, then let the customers also um, create the reverse zones for themselves. And then you can just delegate that similarly in how you did with um, IPv4 and also with forward domains. The next column here is your SOR or what we call as second opinion request. Now, I think you, you would notice that in most cases here, it just says either no or not yet. In IPv4, when you are a service provider, when you are an LIR, when you are going to delegate IPv4 address blocks, there is a maximum that you can give. It usually starts very small, especially if you are a new um, entrant or you're a new company, then it starts small. That means if you're going to assign something that's bigger than what you currently have, you will then have to consult with APNIC because they have the knowledge, they have the um, pretty much the resources to help you out in doing proper and um, proper assignment. So that is what we call as a second opinion request. In IPv6, so far, the current policies does not specify that you need to do a second opinion request. Okay, so that's why you can see there, there's a lot of no's or a lot of not yet. Um, the only thing that is recommended with IPv6 when you do delegation is if you are going to delegate slash 48 to your customer, make sure that each of those slash 48 is um, registered on the APNIC who is database. So it's either you register them or your customers register them, but most of the time, because you are the APNIC member, then you have access to the who is database, then you should be the one okay, registering that and then put in the details of your customers. All right, so that is um, the current policy that we have right now. Um, what else do I need to add there? Basically, second opinion request, is it, that's pretty much it. Um, just make sure that all your slash 48s have been, that are delegated, have been registered. It's also helpful because when you come back to APNIC and request for your subsequent allocation, then it's easy to check whether you have achieved an HD ratio of 0 0.92 because it's very easy to see that you have those records and where you delegated them to. All right, so again, registration is an important thing. Okay, um, it's highly recommended, especially for things that are smaller than slash 40. So each of these customers, see, you need to have registration for all of them. All right, so that's pretty much it. That's just a sample. Um, if you look at previous conference materials, um, APNI conferences, you can also see some other um, addressing plans that have been done by um, our members of our community. So I encourage you that before you actually dive into your own addressing plan to read as much as possible into um, these examples that are available for you to see, um, just so you you don't get into trouble um, or problems uh, later on because you know you have actually done it correctly based on how others are doing it. All right, so that's pretty much it. That's um, a sample addressing tool. Uh, it's very simplistic one, I would say, but something that where you can base your um, your addressing if you are going to dive into it. All right, so some addressing tools here. I haven't used um, some of them, especially the ones here, but NetDot is actually something that is 
highly recommended by um, a lot of people in the community. They have support not just for V4 but also for IPv6. So have a look at them. It's highly maintained. These are the ones that are um, available as open domain, as open source. But there are heaps available as well as, let's say, something that's proprietary that you may have to um, spend some resources or spend some money on. But for those that are available as open source, NetDot is something that you can see a lot being used and developed in the community. And a lot of others that are listed here might also be helpful for you. All right, so that's pretty much it. That's um, the end of our uh, IPv6 address planning discussion. Do you have any questions? If you do, please write them down on the chat. While you're doing that, I'm also going to put in the link to the survey so that you can fill it in when you have the time. So this is the link to the survey. So no questions, no questions at all. Seems very quiet. I know it, it can be a lot to take in. It looks very simple. It's, it looks like something that you can just ignore. But um, once you are already doing your actual IPv6 deployment, then it will all make sense. Okay. Um, my suggestion for now is download the slides and then try to do the addressing. Try to do the subnetting based on the given, based on how we are subdividing them. Um, and then see how it works for you. See um, if that would fit into your current um, um, network topology. All right. So that's pretty much it. Thank you very much, everybody. I hope that you learned something throughout the day. If you have colleagues, if you have friends who also wants to know about these things, um, please tell them that we do offer a, um, IPv6 e-learning courses every first um, Wednesday of the month. And um, hopefully we'll get more participation from others, especially now that IPv6 is growing and we need more knowledgeable people to um, actually deploy them. We need network engineers who are experts in IPv6. Okay, so I hope after this you will read more into IPv6 and hopefully um, be experts yourselves. All right. Thank you very much and have a great day, everyone. I hope to see you in another e-learning course. Bye-bye.